The reason I founded Global Giving is that I would be in developing countries and I would see these people in these local communities doing whatever it was that they thought would help make the lives of those people better. In the midst of electricity outages, civil wars, typhoons, it was just something I had to sort of drop everything and support. Since 2002, more than 1.4 million donors have used Global Giving's online platform, contributing more than $659 million to nonprofit projects around the world. They have helped implement more than 31,800 projects in 175 countries, changing communities and countless lives for good. planting these mangroves because mangroves are critically important in, uh, in defending a, an island from the storm surges. They're also good breeding grounds for fishes. Why give money instead of substance? And that's very important for people to know because you might want to give 100,000 cans of beans. But if you send 100,000 cans of beans and they already have 300,000 cans of beans, then they're going to go to waste. Because you donated through Global Giving, you gave more than just financial support. You gave social entrepreneurs the support of an entire global community, along with the tools, training, and resources they need to become even more effective. Welcome to Community Forward, celebrating 20 years of global giving. My name is Patricia Velasquez. I am an actress, I'm also the president and founder of the Wayutaya Foundation. We have been privileged to work with Global Giving, and we are true believers in their mission. I am honored to be your host today. Thank you for being here. Almost every day, we are confronted with stories and images of needs that seem impossibly large. You have seen the heartbreaking news from Russia's war in Ukraine. The tremendous need, sadly, does not stop there. Everywhere in the world, even in our own nations, the need for support is constant. Communities affected by natural disasters, genocide, war, and poverty. Sometimes it seems like despair is the only possible response. But over the past two decades, global giving has proven that each one of us has the power to make a difference. Because need is everywhere, but so is determination and grit and vision Long before crowdfunding was even a term, Global Giving was working to make philanthropy something almost anyone could participate in and almost any cause can access. Since 2002, over 1.4 million people have given more than $654 million through Global Giving, money that was given directly to support over 31,000 specific community-led projects in more than 175 countries. Over the next hour, we'll hear from Global Giving employees, partner organizations, and a few special friends about how Global Giving empowers first responders from within disaster-affected communities, leading to a faster, more effective relief, and rebuilding efforts that represent their community's true needs and priorities. How crowdsourced philanthropy can work to achieve gender equality, even in communities where women are traditionally marginalized, and what it means for communities to take the lead and change the world for the better from the inside out. We'll be accepting your donations throughout the hour while promoting our mission with the hashtag Community Forward across social media. We'll also be featuring a series of special performances from poet Reggie Cabico of Story Tapestries, dancing from Fundación Gramo Dance, and music performed by the World Heartbeat Music Academy. But first, I'm gonna turn it in over to Donna Kalijon. And this is not on the script, but I'm a big fan. 
who has been with Global Giving since 2003 and is currently serving in the role of interim CEO. Donna? Thank you, Patricia. Global Giving was founded by Mari Kuraishi and Dennis Whittle, two former world bankers with a vision to reimagine philanthropy as a participatory bottom-up process rather than a top-down elite process. Contrast this with traditional models of philanthropy where nonprofits and causes constantly compete to attract finite dollars from a small number of wealthy donors. And the business models result in such a tiny percentage of funding getting to the ground to those organizations serving their communities. I've been with Global Giving since 2003. And during that time, I have seen what is possible when donors of all shapes and sizes have a safe and easy way to give what they can. And I've seen firsthand how community-led responses to the kinds of problems we read about and we are experiencing every day are solved by community leaders. Those responses are more creative, more resourceful, and more sustainable. Take, for example, one of our many community partners in Puerto Rico, La Maraña, who brought immense love, creativity, and inclusion to their response to Hurricane Maria. Imagination for me is, is possibility. The aftermath of, of Hurricanes Irma and Maria, it's safe to say that it was a failed government response. It's like no one is coming. No one is coming to save you. No one is coming for your family. You have to come for yourself. We've been supporting these communities and co-designing what are the spaces that they need in order to thrive, not only as a response to the hurricanes, but also in the long-term effect of what a just recovery looks like. We have the experience, but we haven't had the opportunity to take the control and say, this is what our communities are asking. This is what we are needing. We are going to design it and we are going to build it. I imagine a Puerto Rico where communities have the resources and the tools to imagine and build the future that they desire for themselves and for ourselves as a whole. This is work that has been done in and by the people in disaster-affected communities. These are the people who are most capable, motivated, and thanks to your donations, now resourced to respond to their own needs most effectively. Which leads me to the topic of our first panel, disaster response and recovery, in conversation with our host, Sandrina da Cruz. But before we dive into that, let's welcome the very talented Reggie Kamiko from Brooklyn, here to read a poem for us on behalf of longtime global giving partner, Story Tapestries, an arts education nonprofit operating out of the Washington DC metro area. My name is Reggie Kibiko from Story Tapestries, and I will share with you a poem called The Night Sky, written by a fourth grade student named Choice. The night sky, the night of peace, the stars of kindness, the sky of silence, the winds of curiosity, the moon of shyness, the night of peace, the owl of madness, the trees of craziness, the crickets of rudeness, the night of peace. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you for that wonderful reading, Reggie. I'm Sandrina de Cruz, Director of Disaster Response for Global Giving. My team and I work closely with local leaders, listening, learning, and providing them with the resources they need to support their communities as they respond to disasters and humanitarian crises. Global Giving has responded to more than 850 crises and natural disasters since 2004, domestically and around the world. 
Our long-standing relationships with community leaders around the world have enabled us to get resources directly to affected communities almost immediately. What stands out to me about the video we just watched, and which I fundamentally believe we need to carry into our globally focused work, is that solutions lie in the communities themselves. And our aim should be to achieve a just and sustainable recovery to all disasters and humanitarian crises. Here to tell us more about what that means are two inspirational leaders I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for disaster responses in Puerto Rico and Haiti. Marie-Rose Roman Murphy, co-founder of Espoir, a Haitian-led international leadership network focused on the long-term capacity building of Haitian organizations. And Carlo André Oliveras Rodriguez is the executive director of La Maraña, whose video we just saw. I invite uh, Carlo André and Marie-Rose to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their work. Um, over to you, Marie-Rose. My name is Marie-Rose Roman Murphy, and I have been involved in humanitarian, the humanitarian sector, the development sector, and philanthropy for the past 30 years. After the 2010 Haiti earthquake, which was devastating, um, I felt like I had no choice in terms of getting involved. So as a result, I have to say that I ended up uh, starting a couple of organizations. One of them is Espoir, which is transnational but very much really led. And the other one is what's called Fondation Communautaire Haitienne et Croix, which is better known as the Haiti Community Foundation. Thank you for inviting me and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Very nice to be here. Um, thank you, Sandrina. And very nice to be here with Marie Rose. Um, I'm Carlo André Olivera Rodriguez. Um, I have the privilege of being the executive director of La Maraña, uh, design and planning nonprofit in Puerto Rico that works um, directly with communities in the imagination and development of what a just recovery or what the communities um, look like. Um, how does that look like? I'm very happy to be here and thanks for Global Giving for all the support throughout this process. Thank you and welcome both. So on that note, I'm going to start with some questions to get the conversation going and so that we can all learn more about you and your work. Carlo Andre, watching your video got me thinking about the power of imagination. So let's imagine that the status quo and disaster recovery funding changes. Everyone hearing this talk becomes an advocate for more equitable community-led disaster recovery. And with a snap of our fingers, suddenly the ratio shifts. So we'll have 98% of humanitarian and disaster recovery resources are in your hands, the hands of local leaders who know the needs in their communities better than anyone. Carlo André and Marie-Rose, what would the world look like? What initiatives would you prioritize? I would say that everyone that has gone through disaster is able to have a house, um, have housing, have a safe roof over their heads and has access to water and energy. Um, it seems it seems basic, but that's where we are. I think um, we are we are struggling at the moment in history with having decent housing for for our communities and having being able to secure land in their own country. So, if something like that were to happen, we would start by planning, and planning that would involve all of the community members and stakeholders, and planning, frankly that would also involve um, other people working in the, community, in the community, whether we're talking about international stakeholders or we're talking about you know, everyone, uh, in order to make sure that we are actually all at the table and discussing what we can bring, what are the community's priorities, and how we can best use this fund, who has the expertise to do it, and what all can we do in terms of short term and long term? And yes, I think very often you have people in the communities, communities have, have very modest dreams, but I think it's essential as, as you, like you said, Carlo Hendry, that we do have systems that look at people's dreams because this is what drives us. Thank you, thank you for bringing that Marie Rose. Um... We, we at La Maraña have, um, imagination is a, a very important word. I think 
it comes a lot, um, as you said, because not we have we have dared to radically dream um, and to take dreaming and imagination as our flag, um, acknowledging that a lot of us weren't supposed to dream. Um, we were expected to to not fit in the box. We were expected to not have an opportunity to to take charge of our future, of our desires, of our dreams. Um, and I think at a point in this and and being exacerbated as well by COVID, we are we are definitely and most certainly daring daring to dream and to and to make it happen. And on my last question, uh, and I think it's human to want to remain hopeful, uh, I'd like to ask both of you uh, a personal question. When faced with deep need among your neighbors on a daily basis, what gives you hope? Um, we we just launched um, a laboratory for participatory design, and and when we were receiving the the applications you see that we are, we are there, like people are there asking and acknowledging and meeting together and getting to difficult spots and having difficult conversations, but acknowledging that they want something different to happen and they don't, might not know how that looks like or how to get there, um, but they know that they want it to happen. And that allows for hope to keep thriving and for us to keep like taking, taking the space and writing proposals and getting there and having conversations because um, in the end, in the end, we do that. We go through that space to do all the writing and do the, all the process that entails just to ensure that some of those resources are able to get to the people that will make the most of it in order to ensure that they have a better present. You know, it, it's sort of interesting because I love quotes and there is a quote that I saw that um, gave me pause um, and that I would like to, um, to share. Um, and, and for me, it, it's also about the continuity of, of our land, the continuity in terms of our spirit and uh, whether we're talking about our ancestors or the, the future in so many ways, you know, I think we come from cultures that understand that this is whatever land that we have may be ours, but it's really sort of like our ancestors and our children. So that somehow we have to, to pass it on and make it better. And uh, the quote says, suddenly all my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And um, sometimes we have to remember who came before us and who is coming, the many people and the multitude that who are coming after us. With this hope and your compelling visions, I know we are all ready for this reimagined future. As Carlo Andre and Marie Rose have beautifully articulated, it's critical that we continue moving towards a more just and equitable disaster and humanitarian response and recovery. Solutions lie with communities. The evidence is there. We've read the research. We hear from amazing leaders on the front lines like Marie Rose and Carlo Andre. And we know what we have to do to deliver more impact to communities affected by disasters. Carlo Andre and Marie Rose, thank you for sharing your time, your experience, your critical insight and wise counsel with us. We're proud to be on this journey to a more to more just disaster recoveries with you and our global community. Global Giving is committed to shifting power and resources to local communities in the aftermath of disasters. And now I'm gonna pass it along to Patricia who is going to guide us uh, through more beautiful conversations and fun activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrina, Mary Rose, and Carlo for your insight, and even more for your tireless efforts. Now we'd like to take a moment to hear about the lasting impact Global Giving has made from those who have worked with Global Giving over the years, as employees, leaders, and partners. In Kiswahili, we say, haba na haba kujaza kibaba, which means little by little fills the bucket. 
Now this concept is truly evident in Global Giving's work where the power of crowdfunding is harnessed professionally and in the process, the partners are also empowered to be able to do this on their own. Congratulations to Global Giving for 20 years. It's truly remarkable and it's really inspired me to think about global and community driven needs. You know, they often say that those who are closest to the work are best poised to find the solutions. And I find that global giving really does connect those who are closest to the work with the best solutions possible for funders and donors. It's commendable how over the years, global giving has been able to bring together community-led changes and institutions from all over the world in its platform. What makes it work more impactful is how it mobilizes these institutions via its unique campaigns and helps these institutions raise funds in a creative manner. Well, I think global giving is impactful because you genuinely respect what's going on on the ground and you build relationships and trust people. We felt very much that um, our assessment of what our needs were was respected and you were prepared to back us and put the resources into that. And um, there aren't too many funders who do that, so it's an inspiration. It always amazes me how much Global Giving has helped so many charities with their fundraising efforts. And here at Reef Chat Malaysia, we are so thankful for the relentless guidance and effort that has helped us save our oceans and coral reefs. Our organization, Puerta Abierta, has no words to thank Global Giving for how much they have done for us. We have uh, grown our impact not only because of the fundraising, but because of the learning process we have gone with them. Thank you very much. During the Ebola crisis in West Africa, Mind Leaps used our global giving project to quickly raise essential funds that allowed us to provide life-saving services to straight children. Global Giving's work has inspired me over the past 20 years to have a more grassroots and community-framed mindset. Um, they have taught me that there is a space for all NGOs, um, from the big splashy organizations with all the staff that you could ever want, all the way down to the organizations with zero staff and zero marketing campaign funds. Recently, the GAF Fund that Global, Global Giving is giving us, we have been able to have Confident Girls Club in 30 schools in Nigeria to raise about 150 confident girls that are raising their voices against sexual violence. Thank you. Hi there everyone, it's John Oliver and I'm excited to wish Global Giving a happy birthday. Congratulations on 20 years of community-led change around the world. Keep up the amazing work and thanks to everyone who makes it possible. And now, please join me in welcoming our next performers, Fundación Gramo Dance, an innovative company of aerialists and modern dancers out of Panama who organize performances and classes that help youth at risk to realize the transformative power of art in their lives. Gramo dance, wow, <laughs> that was incredible. I think I could do about uh, four or five of those moves. Oh, okay, well, maybe one or two. You know, so many of the projects that Global Giving is proud to support are run by women, often in areas of the world where women are marginalized or mistreated. But even in places where women are not accorded the same rights or voice as men, we see how they hold communities together through the toughest times. And in doing so, 
they often win the right to participate more fully in community leadership. This next video tells the story of Dr. Grace B. Mose Okongo, who created the Hope Foundation for African Women to combat gender inequality in rural Kenya through economic empowerment, promotion of sexual and reproductive health, with a focus on ending female genital mutilation practices and advancing human rights through education. My childhood is informed by this horrible practice called female genital mutilation. It was a painful experience which would never leave my mind. I wanted to change my life. I wanted to be independent. But more important than anything else, I wanted to do a course that can help me understand why such a horrible practice continues. So as I did all the research, it occurred to me that even though I want to end FGM, I can't end it alone. I felt like this is the opportunity I have to begin a movement of ending female genital mutilation. So I started Hope Foundation for African Women. We don't go in telling people this is what you should do. They know themselves better than anybody. They are willing to share ideas and experiences that they already have. It is because of that process that is empowering to them to discover for themselves and to own the process. What drives me is the motivation I get from the women I'm working with and the men who have joined the movement. Because then I know a better day is ahead. Dr. Okongo has expanded the work of the Hope Foundation with help from Global Giving. In addition to education and advocacy, HOPE has now distributed 139 interest-free loans to women entrepreneurs in rural Kenya who previously had no access to credit. Which brings me to the topic of our next discussion, gender equality and the role of women in community-led change. In conversations with Maggie Palmer from the Red Backpack Fund, Patricia, thank you so much for your very kind introduction. My name is Maggie Palmer, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Pep Talk Her. We're on a mission to close the gender pay gap. We launched a free app that helps you track your professional successes so that you can advocate and negotiate for pay raises and promotions. We also work in-house with Fortune 500 companies, supporting them to hit their leadership targets. I was the very proud recipient of a Spanx Red Backpack grant, and that's how I came to know about the incredible work that Global Giving is doing in the world. So it is such a treat to be here today and to virtually meet two incredible women, Dr. Grace, who is the founder and director of the Hope Foundation for African Women, and also the brilliant Christina from Global Giving. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dr. Grace, I'd love to start with you. I want to hear more about your journey because it's incredible what you have accomplished. Something that I think is important to talk about today is that violence and discrimination around the world is pervasive, you know, and we know that one in three women will experience abuse in their lifetime. How have these statistics and your personal experience really steered the work that you're doing today? I was one of the unfortunate girls who went through female genital mutilation. Uh, I believe I was probably nine years and I experienced a certain level of pain that has never left me ever since. Even when I had become a young woman in the university, I continued to experience violence. I didn't have mentorship. There were so many challenges. And so I made a commitment to find out what is it about violence that girls are experiencing all the time? There has to be something important about this practice that makes it so valuable even when People from outside the community are trying to end it. And that is when I discovered that this practice had something to do with the survival of a woman. If a woman did not go through that practice, she didn't have a chance of getting married. Women and girls in my community could not inhale land. So if you didn't get married, you had nowhere to go. You had no survival at all. And so my lifelong journey is not only about ending FGM 
but also constantly inspiring the young girls to aspire to become the best that they can be. Dr. Grace, thank you so much for sharing with us more about your story and the incredible grassroots work that you are doing. I wanted to ask you specifically, what is the role that you see women have to play in really driving that community-led change? I realized that many of the people who were working in the community were from outside. They were either from Nairobi or they were from abroad funding the projects that were going on and nothing was changing. So I wanted to find out how insiders who understand what this practice does to them can be the driving force towards ending uh, FGM. And I came back to, the, to Kenya and the Lounge the Hope Foundation for African Women. The first training was of 30 people, 20 women and 10 men. They were so inspired. They go to schools and they mentor the girls. And then we realized we can't just mentor the girls. We have to mentor the boys as well because these are going to be their husbands. But again, there's something else these women are doing. They are changing their own lives. They know their rights. They fight for their rights. But they also do income generating activities because there is a there, there is a realization that women cannot end violence in their lives, especially FGM, if they don't have income of their own. So it has been an enormous work, but it's all generated from the grassroots where women speak up and say, this is where the need is, and they take lead in owning that project, doing the advocacy, and mm -hmm really persistently wanting to end the practice. Christina, I want to bring you in here too. Can you talk to me a little bit more specifically about how global giving approaches gender equality advancement? So first and foremost, we believe that the most promising solutions for any issue, whether that's gender equality or STEM education, come from the people that are truly most impacted. So it's really about global giving, connecting donors and individuals with the change makers on the ground who know the solutions. It really starts with them. And so through global giving, you can check thousands of projects. We have over 1,300 that are specific to gender equality that are supporting communities all around the world. Another way that uh, individuals can engage with global giving on the topic of gender equality is through our Girl Fund. So many years ago, we recognized, along with a couple of key partners, just how powerful it is to invest in young girls. And so the Girl Fund is uh, a way for individuals to give on a monthly basis. There's a matching program supported by Global Giving. And we continue to identify new cohorts of organizations to receive those funds each month. We try to look at all of our programs from an equity lens and identify ways to, to lift up those voices, to elevate those causes and those individuals that often get overlooked, that don't often receive funds. And so my job at Global Giving is about ensuring that these resources get directly into the hands of powerful community-focused leaders like Grace. Dr. Grace, I'd love to throw it back to you. How has the support from the global giving community really paved the way for you and your team at the Hope Foundation for African Women to accomplish such incredible success? Before we joined Global Giving, we literally had no funding whatsoever. So Global Giving has helped us so much. We have reached more than 18,000 students, we have been able to train 100 law enforcement and healthcare providers so they are able to respond better to when a woman goes to seek help. That wasn't happening before. But we know that from our little service that we do, we have really changed the mindset of the people who have gone through our trainings. We gave 139 loans to women to start their own economic generating activities. And then later on, we started our own fund, which we have been able to support about 200 women. We have trained uh, 61 youth, those who are committed to the work of ending FGM. We give life skills. We train people to really think for themselves, see the issue for what it is, because we ask them questions. Like if we show them a picture of a girl who is bleeding, what are you seeing? What is the cause of that? How is this affecting not just the girl, but all of us as a community. And what can we do as a group? So when we go through that method of helping people think for themselves, they make a decision to end FGM. 
rather than the other processes where you criminalize the process, you tell women stop and they don't understand why you are stopping it. So our methodology changed everything and we have been able to reach so many. That is unbelievable progress that you have made. What an impact you are having in the world. What can we do to help? How can we help you? We have no resources. Staying in the grassroots, in very remote communities, you just find that number one, people don't know about you. You are not as visible. You don't have technological know-how to market yourself to a level where you can be known and supported. Most of those organizations which do work on the grassroots don't have much skill in writing proposals, in writing good reports, in doing what the big organizations are able to do. And for that reason, they, they don't even have skills in mobilizing resources. And that is where we now appreciate global giving for the kind of technical assistance, they're providing the platform and really having many of your leaders in global uh, you know, giving being women. Women are more sensitive to the issues of gender inequality. Women provide more resources to issues of gender inequality. And we are grateful that we have this. I think that's really important to remember that all of us have a voice and we can make a difference. And Christina, from a global giving perspective, what can we all do to help support amazing work like that of what Dr. Grace and her team are doing? It's not always easy to know exactly what your needs will be. And that's why uh, dollar resources are really so helpful for these organizations who need to adjust their plans or pivot in light of a pandemic. Believe it or not, I mean, it's really coming down to simple awareness. So a tweet, anything on social media can be really powerful. Grace spoke about um, the importance of empowered women in positions. That is hugely helpful. And then of course, just donations. So whether it's $10 or $100, giving through Global Giving and allowing us to be able to support organizations like Grace's is really what makes the biggest impact. Christina, Dr. Grace, what an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experience and your stories. And thank you for the impactful work that you are doing in the world. We so appreciate it. And it's a great time now to showcase another female-led organization also supported by Global Giving. Let's take a look at Seeding Sovereignty. I come from a long lineage of trauma. My dad was a victim of the Canadian residential school system. My sister was taken away during the 60s scoop era and I'm a former foster kid. When Indigenous people, BIPOC folks, LGBTQIA2S plus folks get together, it's usually in protest. We have to remember what we're fighting for is the access to land, the access to language and the access to joy. I wanna be remembered as somebody who led by example being able to just enjoy the fact that I am who I am has been the biggest healing. We're rolling on native land that has suffered hundreds of years of genocide. The land hurts, and so when the land hurts, the people hurt. But when you impart joy back into the land, the land can thrive, and so can the people. That video featured S.A. Lawrence Welch, and we'll have the opportunity to chat with them more in a discussion about community-led change, specifically within Indigenous communities, hosted by Versha Sharma, Editor-in-Chief of Team Vogue. Thank you, Patricia. As Patricia said, I'm Versha Sharma, the Editor-in-Chief of Team Vogue, Today, I'm joined by Agnes Woodward, the director of Seeding Sovereignty's Missing and Murdered Indigenous People Storytelling Initiative, S.A. Lawrence Welch, Gagichiwan Project Director for Seeding Sovereignty, and Allison Carlman, Director of Evidence and Learning at Global Giving. Thank you all for joining us today. Anshay, it's great to be here. Agnes and S.A., to get us started, would you each tell us about your work with Seeding Sovereignty and your organization's partnership with Global Giving? Yeah. Um... Thank you again. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, as the project director for the MMIP Storytelling Initiative, 
I work closely with family members of missing and murdered Indigenous people. I'm also a fan, family member myself. And so it's, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here at Seeding Sovereignty. There is a storytelling aspect to the initiative where I host a storytelling session with an MMIP family member. And so family members have time to share their loved one's stories. It's an opportunity for them to have to be the voice of their loved one, and also to just raise awareness and amplify, uh, you know, their needs. The other aspect is on global giving. The donations that we receive allows us to compensate these uh, MMIP storytelling guests, and also we are able to help with services to family members in their time of need. We're able to offer financial help for important things like search efforts with costs related to things like memorials and gatherings that they plan and just tangible care that hopefully leaves MMIP family members feeling supported and cared for. And as we continue to develop this program, we hope to create safe spaces that really focus on healing for, for families with those lived experiences. Um, so I direct both Gagichi Heavy Win as well as another project, Medicine Wheels, uh, which was seen in the video. And um, it's just such an incredible way to offer tangible relief to people based on uh, the proximity to our own experiences that we've had uh, lived as Indigenous people. I know both Agnes and I have had uh, our own um, experiencing experiences as walking statistics as Indigenous people. And so what we have experienced, we don't wish for anyone else. So being able to have a platform and be able to develop programming that empowers and enables people to feel a little bit of reprieve amidst a world that was never meant to include them, them is incredibly, incredibly important. For both an inside the community and outside of it, I wanna talk a little bit more about what donors and the general public can do to support your work, more specifically this community led work. What would you like to see from people? Um, well, every indigenous community has within itself the tools and the solutions to create change, but not every indigenous community has you know, the resources to implement those changes. So donor, donors are very important and a needed uh, part of creating any change um, within communities, especially indigenous communities. And MMIP specific, I believe families should be empowered to be the voices and the leaders uh, leading the work within this movement. And the work that we're doing at Seeding Sovereign Sovereignty, specifically uh, the general public and donors, can take the time to listen to, to this community of MMIP family members. Because if we take the time to listen to any community, then we hear what the needs are. We hear where the support is needed and where it's wanted and welcomed. And Allison, I see you're, you're nodding along as well. What can you add for us from the global giving perspective and, and the work that you've done with this organization as well? Yeah, thank you. You know, what Agnes and SA have said really resonates with what we've heard from community leaders around the world. So we conducted this participatory research where we simply asked community members and community leaders in six countries what community-led means to them and how donors can help or hurt community-led approaches. And the people we spoke to said that donors can enable community-led change when they approach their giving with listening, as Agnes said, with a sense of humility and partnership and curiosity about local contexts. They said, please offer flexible funding so community leaders can give back to their communities in the way they know, as, as Essay and Agnes both described. They said no to top-down agendas from donors. They said yes to non-financial support and training and capacity building resources. And finally, they said no to donors telling them how the money is best spent. Because we see time and time again that folks like Agnes and SA and their teams and their communities know best how to meet their own needs um, and the needs of, of their communities. Agnes and Essay, is there anything you would add to that about what donors should maybe stop doing um, that may, might hinder your work? The assumption of what needs to be done to rectify a wrong. And um, usually it is from an outside uh, source of somebody who hasn't had a direct experience in um, trauma or forced assimilation efforts put on by the state and government. So people who benefit from those systems tend to think 
that they have it all in the bag. And I think I just want to reiterate that the fact of the matter is, is listening to the people who had violence perpetuated against them, usually they have the best solution. It's just not heard. So Allison, what opportunities and challenges have you encountered um, in serving communities and being community led on a global scale? Yeah, thanks for asking. So this research that we've been doing and engaging with our partners who are community leaders um, has really directed us to look inward about how community led we are at Global Giving and how are we engaging with this idea that Agnes just shared about nothing about us without us. So we went from research to understanding how ways that we can build to share power within our organization. So for example, last month, we had folks from around the world joining us for this 16 hour co-creation process um, where we were inviting nonprofit leaders to help us reimagine one of our new products and services, replacing an old one that was inequitable. Um, and we invited folks to come, we paid them for their time. We made sure they had the technology support, um, the simultaneous tra live translation for folks whose preferred language wasn't English and made sure that everyone could participate in a way that makes them feel comfortable and able to help design the services that they will then hopefully be able to use or folks like them will be able to use. And so we're doing things like this, we're exploring ways of sharing power with the people we intend to serve. Um, you, you know, we can't be in relationship with every single one of our nonprofit partners, but we've seen that there are ways to more deeply engage with a wide variety of leaders who represent many communities, as each of us do, um, so that we can share power with people like Essay and Agnes here who have so much knowledge and experience from which we can learn. I wish we had more time because this is such an important conversation, but Essay, I want to give you the last word about this. If there is anything that we haven't discussed or something that you encounter frequently in your work that you would just like to address. Personally, in my work with Gikichi Iriwin, I think one of the greatest issues is the concept of um, it happened a long time ago. And I think one of the biggest issues that we face as Native peoples uh, to this landmass is that it didn't happen that long ago and we're still suffering um, present day repercussions based on the actions of some and people don't want to take responsibility for what their kin have been uh, responsible for but what they benefit from and i think um one of the the main things is it's okay to be uncomfortable um, native people live with a lot of discomfort every day but one of the things that we also live with is an immense amount of joy um because we still exist. And so understanding the proximity and privilege of choice that people that live on our traditional homelands experience versus what we experience. It's, again, it's okay to be uncomfortable knowing these truths. It's also okay to start doing little things. And it's okay to start asking questions. We don't expect this generation to that currently lives to fix everything that has been done but we can make ripple effects to make it easier for generations to come. And um, that's really it. The trauma didn't happen a long time ago. It's still very much present. And, and facing that really will help us move towards a better future. Thank you so much for that. S.A., Allison, Agnes, thank you so much for joining us today for this incredibly valuable discussion. It's given me a lot to think about. I, I hope it's given everybody here a lot to think about as well. Um, and thank you, most importantly, for the work that you do every day. It's incredibly inspiring. And now I'll throw it back to Patricia and Donna. Thank you to all of our moderators and panelists for sharing their stories their thoughts, and their hopes. One thing we believe strongly at Global Giving is that seemingly small ideas can make a big difference. Take, for example, a story that Dennis likes to tell about the early days of Global Giving. On the surface, it's a story about a toilet block in a rural part of India, a $5,000 project that was the first funded through Global Giving. But it isn't about toilets. It's about dignity, and safety and the future for many, many girls. That toilet block, funded by a handful of donors, meant that girls would not have to miss school during their monthly cycles, which was a common practice. This very, very basic need, identified by the community and funded through global giving, increased the number of girls 
who would complete their education and access greater opportunity as they started their adult lives. That's just one story of thousands. The beauty of the global giving model is that anyone can give and anyone can benefit. During this event, people just like you have given amounts between $1 to $1,000 and more, raising critical funds that will be placed directly in the hands of community change makers all over the world. These funds come from individuals through corporate sponsors like Nike, Ford, and Cummins, and from foundations like the Omidyar Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, two early and crucial supporters that believe in the power and efficacy of the global giving model. If you'd like to support the work of global giving, I invite you to consider a gift to the Global Giving Forward Fund, which supports training, education, special grants and research that benefits our nonprofit partner organizations in every part of the globe and helps ensure that global giving will be here for them for the long term. Our goal is five million and 6,500 donors have already contributed 3.3 million to this fund. Search for the hashtag community forward to learn more about the global giving mission to empower local community change makers and how you can support it. And before we turn to our closing remarks, please enjoy this performance of Avery Sunshine's I Got Sunshine, performed by the amazingly talented students of World Heartbeat Music Academy a global giving partner organization out of the UK that offers music tuition and personal development opportunities to disadvantaged children and young adults in Wandsworth and other boroughs surrounding London. Hey guys, it's lovely to see you all. We're going to be performing I Got Sunshine by Avery Sunshine. Feel free to get, get up and dance um, and we hope you enjoy. One, two, three, four.
The world has changed a lot since 2002, but the mission of global giving is more relevant than ever. Our work with local communities gives us hope that change is possible. We've seen time and time again how people are the most creative, capable, and engaged when working to better the lives of those around them. Thank you so much for watching. We welcome your reactions and your thoughts. Please share them with the hashtag community forward. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Patricia, our moderators, our panelists, and our film participants. Most of all, thank you to the brave nonprofit partners who have chosen Global Giving as their partner for the last 20 years. And thank you to every donor and every business leader who has supported our mission over the last two decades. We can't wait to see how much more this diverse and committed community can do together.